All right, all right. Good morning. We're going to start with a minute of silence for our Georgia and Florida State fans this morning. Uh, painful, Rick. And I know Kelly's a Florida State. You're a Georgia fan. I I'll give you your, your minute of silence. I know. Morning for Lee. I've already had too many minutes of silence. We're good. Oh man. my We're moving god! On. We're, We're moving, moving on, on, man. It's just a it's kids playing a football game, man. That's what I kept telling myself. Keep telling. Ah, painful. All right. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's jump into the numbers real quick. Um, all right, Fulton County. Uh, last week there was 383 active inventory. I told you to just disregard that week because this is Thanksgiving week. So this week, active inventory bounced back to 737. If you look back previous weeks, uh, 648 before Thanksgiving, 744, 819, 754, pretty decent number on active inventory. It was just a one week anomaly as far as, uh, Thanksgiving was concerned. 88 active under contract, which is a little bit off, but it may be off because of the lack of inventory over Thanksgiving holiday or maybe lack of activity. Pending was 197. Same kind of conversation. It may be a little off just from that holiday lull. And then closings, we did 255 closings. If you go back to the end of the previous month, they we did 259 closings at the end of October. We did 255 in the end of November. I'll take it. It sure looks like that's a pretty flat month over month between October and November. Y'all see anything else in there? Kind of back to the new norm. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is an interesting conversation right now is a lot of the news media is starting to report that inventory is up and I'm not convinced it's up. Um, I'm seeing some signs of inventory climbing, but I'm not convinced that I would go out on a limb and say that inventory is up. Uh, but you'll see it in some of the articles. Um, all right, DeKalb County, there's 400 active uh, inventory here, which is pretty uh, consistent with what was going on previous Thanksgiving. 52 on the active option or under contract. Um, I'll take that. Uh, pending 137, maybe a little bit off on the under contract and pending. And then uh, 154 in the closing category. We did 161 and 144 at the end of October. Uh, we did 154 at the end of November, which is higher than the end of October, but there were some big weeks going into the end of that month that we didn't see in November. So it's probably down in DeKalb County. Uh, and if I run out and just hit uh, Cobb real quick, let's see. Roll on over here. We got 375 in the active inventory front, uh, which is a little bit lower than what it was trending. 62 in active under contract, which is uh, a little bit off of what it was trending. Pendings at 119, which is certainly off from where it was. Uh, and then closings was 164. A month ago, it was 172. Um, it, it does look like November was less than October, uh, in Cobb County. So it looks like Cobb County and, uh, Fulton County, uh, are a little off from where they were month over month, but, uh, DeKalb County looks pretty consistent. Did y'all see anything other than that? All right. What do you think? Interest rates this morning. Uh, I'm showing a six and a half on a 30 year FHA. We Googled it last week. I think the FHA loan limits like 590. So most of Metro Atlanta 
could purchase real estate with an FHA loan if they wanted to, and they don't have to put 3% down, they could put more down. Of course, sellers are need to be a little more educated around what that means, but that's still a pretty awesome interest rate for somebody buying a $400,000 house, right? Um, I don't, do think there is the uh, mental barrier between a 7.01 interest rate and a 6.99999 interest rate that will happen uh, in the near future. Yet uh, I'm looking at these rates going, they're not bad. They were bad. They're not bad. And the story I would be telling, and I, and I would love to hear y'all's comments on this, is I think there's a short window of opportunity right now, which is I believe the best price you're going to buy real estate is right now, mm -hmm. and that prices are going to start going up again by second quarter next year. And if you're wanting to try to take advantage of getting the best deal today and get the best rate tomorrow when the rates come down if you buy a house today for a great price and take a 7.09 percent interest rate i think at some point you would have the opportunity to refinance that at close to six uh maybe second quarter next year but at some point in time in the next 24 months and then you're going to get a, the best rate and the best price and, and you win. And that's kind of the opportunity of what a great real estate consultant, I think, is helping people see right now. There, I'm going to throw that out. And what do y'all think? Brett, I would completely agree with you. Um, it's interesting to me because we were like, what, five weeks ago, about eight and a half percent. And it's kind of every single week, it's dropped a little bit. So it's awesome to see we're at seven. But it's, but it's interesting, like just a handful of months ago, we were at seven and everyone was lamenting seven. Now we're celebrating seven and we're going to hit the upper sixes and we're going to celebrate upper sixes. So I'm in full agreement. The window of opportunity is now the first part of January. And actually, I would probably say this. I think we're going to start seeing prices go up, assuming we have that no winter weather of ice storms and something else slowing us in January. We're going to start seeing them in February. Prices going up. Um, we'll just even because... see the rust in January. If well, we get well, nice just... weather in January and rates down, the first spring could be January 5th. Uh, correct. I think spring always starts after really sometimes January 3rd, or maybe it's after Martin Luther King Day now. But, um, with that said, that's barring weather. But I'm, I would say we'll start to see prices push even sooner, not necessarily March, maybe even sooner than that. But anyway, I just love, I love the psychology behind how seven felt like a horrible rate a few months ago. Now we're celebrating it because we were at eight and a half. Yep. Yeah, life's relative. And, you know, I've said it before, the best time to buy, buy real estate is now and any time in the past. And so the reality that you might have a chance to, you know, refinance out of this, if the numbers work today at seven, man, there's no reason not to move on it. And I do think that sellers that are selling now need to sell this isn't just we'll see what happens and maybe we get lucky like this is the, everyone realizes the it, most people let's let's qualify that realize that supply and demand are there's a shift and that you know if you're marketing now it's because you have to sell not just a convenient sale to see what happens so that's that's the nature of seasonality in the holiday season from my you know 30 year experience yeah. and fewer buyers are moving around because it's cold they're distracted by the holidays so i think this is a favorable season to consider a purchase for sure. And maybe the best, like you said, as soon as spring market hits, the dynamics of buyer seller, you know, again, the supply demand curve could shift again and probably will, especially if I saw a couple articles where there's some, you know, some prognosticators suggesting interest rates might creep even a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, uh, creep which direction? South. Yes. So. Uh, so there's there's a lot of chatter going on in the uh, economic world. Um, and the first one I'll, I'll put up here says the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates six times in 2024 as the economy shows clear signs of cooling down. 
Now, it, here's where I think this is a little bit of an irresponsible headline is because <laughs> um, the way the Federal Reserve works is they cut cut an interest rate or they raise an interest We just went through a period where they raised the interest rate. Um, they're saying it's going to come down. But the way they work is they'll make a, a 0.25 or a 0.5 reduction in the Federal uh, Reserve rate. And then they wait and see how the economy responds. So somewhere in the middle of those six times, it may not respond the way they want it to. And there went the six times. So it's it's almost you can't predict that specifically. But I do think the message is uh, predictable in the sense that the economy is certainly slowing down in the U.S. And it's not just the real estate market or the real estate industry. It's the entire economy, uh, which I think they know uh, if the economy starts to slow and they believe that inflation is in check, they're going to want to speed up the economy again. And this is how they'll do it. And I think they're going to start doing it next year, which will will be good for us, right? Um, and then the interest rate cuts will be in response to a slowing U.S. economy. Uh, they'll start second quarter and extend well into 2025. The reason for that is there's probably a six-month lag in Fed doing interest rate cuts to where it actually takes effect in 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 the markets, um, but uh, there's a cooling job market, moderating inflation, deteriorating outlook for consumer spending. Um, we'll see a lot of uh, interesting media around the consumer spending around the holidays, and if people are spending their money or not spending their money tells you how people feel about the economy because if they're they feel like the economy is thriving they tend to spend money if they feel like the economy is uh decelerating um they tend to not be as abundant in their spending around the holidays so um i don't know what do you think of this when you read this um if i could chime in real quick two things um i thought it was really interesting that when he made this announcement he was actually on a panel at Spelman and it did a whole thing about, um, you know, the overall state of the economy. And um, this is part of it. And so if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to go to Spelman's website and watch it. Um, another thing is that when this article came out over the weekend, I had four different clients who I've been talking to for the past several months saying, hey, did you see this? Did you see this? And that's an indication that folks want to buy. It's just they are very scared and afraid and confidence is very, very low. And so to your point, Brett, I do think that, you know, um, you know, once it starts happening and we see any kind of a dip, that's going to increase um, interest. And then, unfortunately, we'll go back in the other direction. And interest rates will start going back up again. <laughs> so this is the opportune moment. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I, I, I think interest rates, this is my personal opinion. I think interest rates will settle somewhere in the five, six range. Uh, and I think we'll be there for a decade. I, I don't, I think that's where it'll be. But uh, if you think about this, they've not made a single rate cut yet, but what are happening to interest rates? Well, it's They're often predicated down. on consumer confidence and belief that that's the direction things are going because lenders need to lend. Yep. I mean, you don't, they don't make money without origination, without turning business. Yeah. So I'll tell you something interestingly uh, I found out was um, historically the mortgage interest rates 2% higher than the 10 year treasury. But right now mortgage rates are more than 2% higher than the 10 year treasury. So it's not trending. And at some point in time, it's got to come back into alignment with that 10-year treasury note. And I think that's what you're seeing here. Is it, it moving back into alignment? Um, but regardless, uh, they predict the cut will happen. Then the Fed chair, uh, he doesn't want us to get all excited about it. He's like, I need to deflate this expectation because I don't want people 
to stall out the economy waiting on something that may or may not happen in the future. Same conversation we talk about. Uh, we It's better to buy now, period. Do not wait until interest rates are six and a half or five. Buy now, get the best deal and refinance and get the best rate later. Make sense? It does. I mean, he has to hedge his bets. Six was an aggressive statement. It almost felt like clickbait, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I'll leave that there. It felt like clickbait. I think his response to, I mean, they're still trying to get inflation down to two, which last time I checked, we weren't there. So. No, I did hear from the NAR economist uh, a couple weeks back, and there's a big conversation around is two still the number. Some people think it's actually two and a half now is like the normal inflation. We'll get it there. All right, let's get, let's get past numbers for a minute. I want to go into this. So, um, Hallelujah. Finally, some good news about the real estate market is the headline. If that's not a clickbait, I don't know what it is. But uh, <laughs> they go in and talk about all the stuff that's happened to the real estate industry. Uh, and like we don't know, we've talked about it forever. Um, but then the good news starts and it says the biggest mortgage rate drop since the pandemic sparks agent optimism. Um, we've already kind of talked through that. But they get into some smaller predictions. And this one says Zillow predicts a breather year for home buyers in 2024. I think if 2020 and 2021 was the year of the seller, 2024 might be the year of the buyer. And I'm not saying seller's market, buyer's market. I'm saying it might be the year the buyer can finally find a way to win without having to pay crazy amounts of cash over asking price without having to fight 20, 30 people for the same house. I think the market's going to be more normal and the way Zillow's using the terminology, they're calling it a breather year for home buyers, which I guess that means the last couple of years, they, uh, what's the best way to say it? They've been sweating bullets <laughs> to be a home buyer. What do y'all think? I, I think this goes back to being what you're comparing it to, because you're absolutely correct. These pandemic unicorn years, I mean, it was a race. It was a race to the finish line and you had to leave everything um, on the table. You had to put everything on the table to make it. And so if we're just pulling it back a little bit, it is a breather. Um is it going back to what we knew pre-pandemic when it seemed relatively balanced and fair? I think it's going to be pockets. Depends where. I think certain pockets you would have a little bit more say as a buyer. Certain pockets you may not. And Atlanta, as we've continued to discuss, is still a, one of the top markets in all of the country. So um, breather from the unicorn years, sure. And probably very welcomed. Um um, as to what the buyers will get, I think it's to be, again, we're going to have to become very, very much uh, street by street. Tiber and I talked about this the other day. It's even price point, street by street, even the mood of the day, the time of the day, as if you're going to win as a buyer more than um, you did in times past. Yeah. I mean, I just think uh, one of the things, this is a, a little uh, opinionated, but I'll, I'll leave it there. The... Um, would you would most people agree with the statement that most of the uh, wealth in America is created through real estate? I think most people would mm -hmm. agree with that statement. So um, historically, we've got equity conversations around people and wealth. And now recently in our uh, in our uh, real estate market, we've got a, a segment of uh, buyers that have been priced out or or pushed out of being able to buy real estate over the last couple of years from new first time home buyers to just unaffordable uh, opportunity for all. Um, so the question is, is how do we recalibrate and create a breather year for people to go back into the game of wealth building uh, and buying houses? Right. And 
one of the conversations we had around the last state of the industry was these Nepo buyers, right? Like you can't buy the most of these first time home buyers need some kind of parental or support or some kind of government uh, assistance program to even buy real estate right now. And uh, so I actually, uh, I want I, I want to fight for the underdog in these conversation and make sure everybody has the opportunity to build wealth through real estate. And so I see this as a really big deal. Like I feel like mm-hmm. morally, ethically, we got to go get people into some houses next year while the opportunity is uh, uh, in front of us. And, what do y'all and, think? And, and I'm grateful that they did up the limits for both FHA. I think they're doing that with the VA. And then of course they did that already with the conventional loans, but I think those they, they need to, that it just opens up an opportunity for folks. Um, and then as real estate professionals, it's, it goes back to the basics, get in the game. I know it's not going back to your first home is not your dream home. Just get in the game and stay in it. Then um, whether you end up holding it on your first property forever or you sell it so you can go buy the next one, it's, we just need to help people get in the game. Yep. Uh, all right. So this one I find it, Rick, do, do you have a comment? Just thinking right. through 2024, one of the one of the variables that may show up is what does institutional purchasing look like and what do REITs and syndications like who are you competing with for affordable housing? So it'll it'll be interesting to see how much cash flow is available still into yeah. next year with current projects potentially suffering. A lot of these guys are had short term rates on their, you know, multifamily. And so they're they're not doing as well as they have done. So it'll be fun to watch because that's it's been a big part of of affordable housing. And the dilemma is that they're not available to owner occupants and they're getting outbid and and people are beating them to the street. Yeah. Speaking of affordable housing, that kind of lends into this next statement. So um, one of the good news, if you will, is they're saying Americans are supporting zoning changes to allow more housing survey finds. So the way I would explain this is as cities grow up, the density of a city and the affordability of that density becomes a challenge in every major city. So one of the best examples of this is the city of Decatur just passed a bunch of zoning changes to allow for uh, garage apartments, uh, a second uh a second dwelling on the same lot that can be rented out or a mother-in-law suite or whatever. So I think what you'll find is not everywhere in the city, but in the densely populated parts of the city, um, there's push for zoning change to allow for uh, different looking housing than we've looked at in the past. Uh, And it just basically says that Americans are warming up to it. And obviously, in the case of Decatur, they passed it, so they they uh, they have warmed up to it. I think you'll see more in our city. Um, home inventory finally showing signs of life in November. Uh, I do not like this statement because it, it, November twenty twenty two was when the entire market stalled. And like the whole consumer just froze in the month of November in 22. And then to go, well, we're 7.5% more in November, 2023. That doesn't mean anything to me, but whatever, whatever they want to talk about, they can talk about. I do think we're doing good, even though I'm going against a positive statement. I I want to make sure I'm real on this call. Um, And then home buyers seizing the day as mortgage rates continue to slide uh i think we've we've already talked about that so let let me just pull down the screen kelly i know you had a perspective you wanted to talk about and then uh i'm feeling really good around where we're going i do think it's uh, uh we're on the back end of of a the storm if you will and it feels like we're turning that corner uh and if we're all still standing on this call come april i think we're all gonna have smiles on our face i think um we we kind of set out a little bit of a challenge over here at the buckhead office like a few weeks ago 
Because it, it 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 can be very easy to look at the month of December and go, well, let me just pull my foot off the gas. It's holiday time. You know, you're probably traveling a little bit. We're probably exhausted from having a very full year already. And I think we've discussed it from the very beginning of this call that honestly, this is the month that you put your foot on the gas. It's opportunity galore for your buyers out there. And even obviously sellers, um, there's still opportunity. If there's still low inventory, they can still compete. Um, and there's something about having a closing in December and having a closing in January, going into the new year, knowing you already have business on the books. It does something psychologically to you to go, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and win. I'm going to go ahead and win 2024 starting now. And we still have time to put people under contract and still close them this month. And obviously, we got time to put them under contract in January. And it should be everyone's goal. If you're experienced, you should have a closing in December and January. If you're on the newer end, make appointments your goal. Like what kind of appointments? The conversation is very easy. It's like, you know, the conversation right now is like, do you have any real estate goals or intentions or dreams or desires in 2024? If so, let's meet. You know, it's a it's a very much a month to be so intentional. And then that week between if you celebrate Christmas and New Year, okay, that could be a little bit of a, let's take another breather so we can gear up after the new year. Um, and I've had our agents who've taken on that challenge come up to me going, I got it. I got one. And you just feel the relief and the excitement and, you know, like an anticipation for 2024 when they go, I got someone under contract for December. And they did it last weekend, like two days ago. So it's still time. Um, but anyway, that's just what I wanted to share going. It, it's like, I love December as my appointment month, um, yeah. and my under contract month. So perfect. Mika, you have a question. It's more of a comment. I have changed, uh, what my language is around some of the people in my pipeline. I have a young man who called me last week and we went out yesterday. He found a property and he thought he was going to wait until March to start. Uh, purchasing, but we had a conversation around what does it look like if you go into contract now and you're able to save on closing costs and reduce the price of your home? Is that enough for you to go into contract now and maybe pay two months of rent and mortgage? Or do you go into the market later on in March and the prices start to go up and interest rates come down and you're in a competitive situation because there's a humble price point? So it's about talking to the people in your pipeline and definitely talking about the opportunities because there are pockets of this city where people have inventory and there are agents who are calling and say, please bring people to buy my house. So it's just looking at the opportunities because they're definitely out there, depending on condos right now are having some opportunities south of Atlanta, east side, Decatur, those sorts of places, especially for the affordable price points because 100%. people aren't moving. I love it. I love it. Um, and I would say new construction. Mika, I'll throw in there new construction, you know, and you plus you want to lock in that homestead exemption for December. Yeah. Um, well, and the first step is to get their attention and create intrigue. If you can't, so my pitch would be, hey, listen, my hunch and the data and show them a few of the articles. It looks like things are going to heat up in the spring and it may not favor you as the buyer. Is there any reason we shouldn't meet now and get the ball rolling just in case you come across the perfect home along the way? Just get that first meeting. You can't have a second meeting without a first. And to Mika's point, she got him in the car. Just go look. I mean, if you're not showing houses every day, you're not in the game. If you're on the buyer agent side. Yeah. Um, Kat put in the chat. She said this season has been tough for me. My mindset has shifted in a negative way, but the podcast, the mindset mentor has really shifted the way I think now I'm excited about the business we'll bring in 2024 instead of stressed. I would highly recommend everyone listen to this podcast, of course. But Kat, I want to comment on the first part of your uh, your comment. Um, I actually want people to know that uh, the ebb and flow of the economy and the ebb and flow of real estate is not void of stress. Uh, we we all sometimes find ourselves at a place where a closing falls apart. Uh, we have a bad month. We, the, the market's down. We didn't anticipate it down, but the difference between, uh, being an amateur and a professional is how you start to train yourself to respond to those things. And, um, it takes you going through an economic downturn 
uh, once before you realize and have a playbook for the next time uh, and, and vice versa. But one of my fears, if I'm being transparent, is how many people got into the real estate industry during the pandemic and they thought it was easy. And now they're going, this is not easy. Yes. Or, uh, and, and then at some point in time, you will be one of those OGs that talks about all your battle scars of how you got through this recession and the one before it and whatever's coming after it. And mindset's a real thing. And I just want to normalize your statement in the sense that you're not alone. We uh, There's days I have... Uh, I go, man, how many more hits can we take? You know, I mean, like we all go through those, but the professional part uh, moves us back to activities and and helps us process it quickly and move forward. But I, I appreciate you saying that. There you go, Mika, you're an OG. <laughs> we that start and end on time. <laughs>